Hi, I'm Chuck Stout, curator at the Wings Over the Rockies Museum. In this episode of Behind the Wings, we're going to take a close look at a Soviet-era jet interceptor, the Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-23. We're also going to take a deep dive into a top secret Air Force program called Constant Peg, and we're going to meet a pilot who flew the MiG-23 in this first-of-its-kind adversary training program. This one's going to be cool. It's time to go behind the wings. Here at the Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum, we have more than 70 amazing aircraft and spacecraft, including the Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-23. Let's take a closer look. In the early 1960s, the Soviet Union needed an airplane that could fly and fight against the American F-4 Phantom and win. They needed something to replace their aging MiG-21s. The engineers at Mikoyan Gurevich studied the American McDonnell F-4 Phantom and the General Dynamics F-111, and it's not hard to see how these airplanes influence their design. The MiG-23 was the first Soviet jet with variable sweep swing wings to enable high-speed flight as well as manageable takeoff and landing speeds. It also had advanced look-down, shoot-down radar. Entering service in 1970, the MiG-23 served with 33 different Soviet and foreign air forces, and it saw combat over the Middle East, Afghanistan, and Africa. The Soviet Union made more than 5,000 of these airplanes. Several MiG-23s, but not this one, came to the United States in 1977 as part of the secret Constant Peg program. They were flown and evaluated in mock combat with American fighters by the 4477th Test and Evaluation Squadron, the Red Eagles, over the Nevada desert until that program was disbanded in 1990. About 6,000 American pilots from the U.S. Air Force, Navy, and Marines got realistic air combat training by flying against Red Eagles pilots flying these Soviet aircraft and using Soviet tactics. To make this episode even better, today we've got one of the pilots who flew MiG-23s in constant peg, Air Force pilot John Mann, who has a lot of experience with this airplane. So John, tell me how you got into flying and tell us how you got to fly the MiG. I went to the Air Force Academy, graduated in 1973, and from there I went to pilot training. At pilot training I earned a fighter and flew the F-4 for a few years. Then I went to the F-15 and attended the F-15 Fighter Weapons School. That qualified me to be in this program. And I became a Red Eagle pilot, I flew the MiG-21 for a while, and then I progressed to the MiG-23. So please, tell us about the beginnings of Constant Peg, this revolutionary way of training and working out a Tonopah. After the Vietnam War, the Air Force looked back and said, how did we do, what do we need to do to be better? And one of the things that came about was, well, we just need to be, have better training. There were, there were many reports about air-to-air -air encounters in Southeast Asia, Red Baron reports and that kind of thing. They all came to the same conclusion. The nexus was we need to have better training. At that time, all of our training was similar, pretty much. You and I in the same unit would train against each other, but that was very inefficient. And so the vision said, let's get some dissimilar assets and let's get some dedicated assets. Fly like the airplanes that we're going to fight against. We used the T-38, we used the F-5E. That was a pretty good MiG-21 simulator, but we had nothing to simulate the MiG-23. And so the idea was, let's get some real airplanes, let's get some dedicated uh, training assets, and let's get our training act back together. We allowed uh, U.S. pilots, both Air Force and Navy, to fly against these and train against these air assets. So you've managed to put together this program and you've got dissimilar assets that you can train against. What was it like to fly the MiG-23? The first thing I'll say about all the MiGs was they're built and designed with a totally different philosophy in mind. The Soviet philosophy was you do what you're told to do. The American philosophy was let's make a smart pilot and let them make real-time decisions. Because of that different philosophy, there's a lot of stuff in the cockpit that is mechanized completely differently from anything we were used to. This airplane is fast. It is really fast. We were expecting it to turn very well also because the initial Intel report said it would turn on a dime. It does not. It's a very, very poorly turning airplane. So fast, doesn't turn, hard to watch the cockpit, figure out the cockpit. It took some getting used to to fly this airplane well. So let's take a closer look at the airplane. Maybe we should start at the cockpit? All right, let's do it. Let's jump in this thing. Well, it's been a while since I sat in this thing. 
This is about how you sit. You sit really deep in the cockpit. Unlike the F-15 where you're on top or the F-16 where you're on top, you sit really deep in this thing. And when the lid comes down, you're trapped. You can't really look around and see. The first thing that I thought about when I saw this cockpit was, wow, a thousand switches, not in any real logical place or, or order. We'll start with a stick, pretty much a normal aircraft stick, a lot of buttons up here. There's only a trim in the elevator direction, the aileron and rotor trim are down here on the dashboard. What this airplane had that other airplanes don't have is a brake in the nose tire. Regular airplanes have brakes only in the main wheels. The nose brake in this airplane made it stop very, very quickly and was very effective. But it hindered taxiing because you couldn't turn very well. Tell me about this white stripe on the instrument panel. Well, sure, because the airplane was so prone to go out of control and when it did go out of control, it was pretty violent. This white stripe here on the front dash is where you put the stick. Just put the stick there, that would be part of your recovery process. This airplane has variable wings, swing wings. How do they change the sweep of the wings? Wing sweep would be forward for takeoff and landing, midway back, 45 degrees back for maneuvering, and I use that word loosely, and then all the way back for going fast. And that was changed manually here in the cockpit. Although we talk about three positions, you could actually put this knob at any position that you wanted to. Also on this side of the cockpit, you have the flaps position. This first button for flight, the second button for takeoff, the third button for landing. These buttons are locked out if the wings are not full forward. And that was a good design feature. Another unique aspect of this airplane was the fuel gauge. The fuel gauge in the 21s and the 23s was not really an indicator, Chuck, of how much fuel is on the airplane. It was just a pointer. So once maintenance would fill the airplane with a certain amount of gas, you could put this pointer on that amount. And then as gas would feed into the engine, the pointer would count down. If there was a fuel leak, you'd have an inaccurate fuel gauge. Engine instruments are on the right side of the cockpit and they're fairly straightforward. You have the wing sweep indicator, RPM indicator, exhaust gas temperature EGT indicator, and your fuel gauge. What's notably absent from this cluster of gauges here is oil pressure. There isn't really an oil indicator in these airplanes. Not having an oil pressure, direct reading air oil pressure gauge is different from a, an American airplane also. That was a little bit different that we had to get used to. So your visibility from the cockpit is so limited and there's no way you can see behind you. So tell me about that uh, window in the roof there. But if you needed to know what was going on behind you, they've installed a periscope. It's up there at the top of the canopy. It's very small. It's a very limited field of view, and if you can imagine driving your car by using a very small part of your, your rear view mirror, that's what this would be like. So for me, flying around at 550 knots, 600 knots, looking backwards through that little tiny mirror, it was there, but it wasn't very useful. You know, one of the things that makes the MiG-23 unique to the, uh, the MiG line is it was the first one with variable geometry. Should we go take a look at the swing wings? You bet, let's do that. So here we are at the wing pivot. Uh, tell us about uh, the variable geometry on the MiG-23. You bet. Well, this particular MiG-23 has the wings swept fully out, 72 degrees. I would never be, I don't think, below maybe 400 knots with the wings like this. With the wings like this, the airplane really was not speed limited. It would go well beyond its max Mach of 2.3. Very, very slick wing combined with a very, very big engine, fast airplane. Moving on to the landing gear here, this airplane was envisioned to invade NATO and land on NATO fields, perhaps on the Autobahns, perhaps unimproved surfaces, so you have big, beefy gear. Unlike a lot of fighters that have what you might call straight up and down landing gear, this has trailing link. This one comes out to the side. When you land, this thing flexes up, so you can land hard. You can land on unimproved surfaces. It's a very, very beefy landing gear. Very, very beefy probably describes the whole airplane. While we're back here at the back, we're also looking at the speed brakes. These things would pop out and help slow you down. Very good speed brakes, very effective, and they're way back at the aft of the airplane, so it kept you going straight also. So when an Air Force pilot came to constant peg, how much time would he get flying against adversary airplanes? You bet, Chuck, great question. And just to clarify, it was U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, and Marine pilots all came up to us, but it was U.S. only. But typically, they come in on a weekend would have academics on Monday and fly Tuesday through Friday. Hopefully, a pilot would get to fly at least once against the 23 and hopefully twice. The first time for either any of the airplanes was kind of like to say, gee whiz, we've actually got these airplanes. We're actually flying them. And they join up on us. They see the different shape, the different sizes, just a familiarization type thing. 
This engine is huge and powerful, very, very powerful. The thrust is immediate. We would demonstrate that on day one or the first time the person saw this airplane. If they flew a second time, we'd incorporate more of a one versus one type training. The second tier training would be occasionally we would fly these airplanes in the red flag exercises. And in that case, it wasn't just one versus one, but it would be out there in the mix in the big airspace doing real things. During our training day one, Air Force pilots, Navy pilots may have trouble against these airplanes. By Friday, we didn't want to come to work because they were going to hand it to us. They were going to have their way with us, which was the purpose of the whole thing. So when American pilots first came to the training and first, saw, first time that they saw a genuine enemy airplane, they might get a little bit of buck fever. I'll go back to the Red Baron reports that summarized what happened in Southeast Asia. There was buck fever and there were mistakes made because they were excited. So bringing these airplanes up to our country went a long way towards eliminating that buck fever in the next encounter. You mentioned that the Soviets have a completely different design philosophy from American engineers and designers, yes. and that must have led to all kinds of challenges, not only in flying the airplane, but in keeping it airworthy. Can you tell us about some of those challenges? The only real challenge I think this program had belonged to our maintainers. This airplane was designed by a completely different design philosophy. All of them had to be taken apart, pieces replaced, manufactured, rebuilt. Our maintenance guys all did that. They took these airplanes apart. They rebuilt these airplanes. We had phenomenal sortie rates, all because of our maintainers. So the real challenge in this program was on their shoulders, and they came through big time. So we learned so much from Constant Peg, and it definitely made a difference in our subsequent conflicts. But what's the legacy of Constant Peg? Now, I'll go back to the beginning of this interview, where I talked about how the Air Force looked back at Vietnam War and said we need to do better because we'd lost a lot of airplanes to enemy aircraft in that conflict. You need realistic training. You need dedicated adversaries. You need the real thing. Desert Storm, we lost zero airplanes to enemy aircraft. If we can keep those universal truths in mind as we move forward, the next 40 years will be as relevant as the last 40 years. So John Mann, it's been a genuine pleasure talking with you today and I really appreciate you coming and cluing us in about the MiG-23. Well, Chuck, it was my pleasure. This is a great museum. You guys do great work. I'm really honored that you guys would, would ask me to be, be a part of this. Thank you. Now, we couldn't cover everything, so please leave your questions and comments below the video, and we'll get to as many as we can. And be sure and come to the museum and see this thing. Now, you've made it to the end of the video, so if you subscribe, thank you very much. And if you don't subscribe, just do it, okay? Now, I gotta get back to work.